Good, uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, this is Patrick from the Poison Pen Bookstore, and it is uh, a treat and an honor to uh, welcome uh, David Joy back to the store, albeit virtually. Um, he's here on the day after. I think your publication date was yesterday, right? Yep, yeah, yeah, that's right. The, the day after the publication of his uh, really terrific new book, uh, When These Mountains Burn. Um, Welcome, David. It's great to see you again. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for having me. In these in these bizarre circumstances, you know. Yeah, uh, yeah. This, I, you know, every time I've ever come and visited y'all, I got to stay at the damn Valley Ho and, yeah, and drink fancy drinks and eat, you know, eat creme brulee and look at people in the swimming pool. And now I'm having to just sit here in front of a computer screen. Not quite the same. No, so, it's yeah. not the same at all. Check out the lo the local talent at the swimming pool and. Try. Have a good time. Um, I wanted to uh, I wanted to kind of kick this off. You know, um, for those of you who haven't read David's books, uh, this is his fourth published novel. Uh, he's the author of The Line That Held Us, which was the winner of the 2018 Southern Book Prize. I've got copies right here. Uh, the Weight of This World and uh, Where All Light Tends to Go, which was an Edgar Award finalist for Best First Novel. And... Um, and this new book, I just want to kick off our discussion because there's a lot, there's a lot to get into, and I, I'll try not to monopolize the discussion like I always do. And if you have questions for for David, uh, please send them in on the Facebook. And I'm kind of, I'll be flying solo a little bit. Uh, and if I'm looking down at my phone, I'm not being rude or checking my texts. I'm just checking to see what questions he might have. So go ahead and send them in. But to kick off the discussion, uh, I love this quote that. Joe Lansdale has on the back of the book, who's, you know, definitely a, a longtime friend and a hero of mine, probably yours too, I yep. imagine. But this is a great quote. He says, uh, this is the sort of novel I love. No worldwide conspiracies or super crimes, just flawed folks making bad choices and having to live with the deadly consequences. Uh, David Joyce quickly become one of my favorite authors in the tra tradition of such fine novelists as Larry Brown and William Gay. It's a great quote. Yeah, yeah. Let's uh, let's just kind of get into the book. I mean, a lot of what we're talking about, at least the way I read it, has to do with um, you know the opioid crisis in uh, in Appalachia and your part of the part of the world. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the transition from the slightly previous era, which is sort of the meth era, into this new opioid era, and you know, how it's devastated the country, but you're part of the world. Yeah, well, I think, uh, I think specifically this part of Appalachia where I live, so I live, uh, you know, in, in the mountains of North Carolina, uh, which is very different from, uh, you know, coal country of Eastern Kentucky or West Virginia. Uh, I, th I think we're really experiencing the height of the opioid crisis uh, here right this second mm -hmm. versus, uh, Elsewhere in the region, I think I think it's been a lot larger problem for longer, uh, and really, I mean, if you look at the reason that that happened, uh, it's as, it's as simple as looking up distribution maps of where prescription opioids were sent in this country, and this region sticks out uh, against the American landscape like a bruise. Uh, you know, it was it was. Uh, I think Appalachia was was systematically targeted by Purdue Pharma. Uh, they they dumped those drugs here at an alarming rate. Uh, you know when that when that company uh, you know filed for bankruptcy last fall, uh, and the Sackler family who who owned that and who and and the makers of OxyContin, uh, part of that settlement was that they had to you know they had to put however much money back into back into the places that they hit the hardest. Well, that money's coming here. Uh, you know, if you go back, if you go back, you know, two years and, and look at the states that had the most overdoses in the country, uh, four out of those top five states were in uh, Appalachia. You know, and so I think, I think if you, if you really want to take a look at why this region is being hit so hard uh, and why we're continuing to deal with that, I, I, I think, First and foremost, you have to address that uh, that reality, which which is that there was uh, very much a geographic uh, sort of targeting 
with the marketing of, of prescription opioids, uh, and that's left us where we are today. Right, and um, you know, you kind of tell the story of this whole kind of era through the through a cast of characters, but in specifically through, as I read it anyway, two two addicts. Um, uh, you know, you've got Ricky Mathis, and ultimately his father, um, yeah. who. His father, I, I really, you know, was reading it, and I see a lot of classical references in there, you know, of a true heroic character, you know, the father. Um, yeah. And uh, and then you have uh, Denny Rattler is the other addict, and the, the novel, at least as I've read it, was kind of the tr their twin trajectories kind of coming together. Yeah. And then in the background, you know, you've got this... Um, apocalyptic fires kind of going throughout the, the whole region. Um, yeah. Can you talk a little bit about, you know, kind of uh, about these, these main characters and, uh, and who they are in the book and uh, maybe the background of, of how you came to write their stories? Yeah, I think, uh, well, I think the setting, you know, as, as far as those fires, uh, I, I think when I really, when these, when these two characters really started to develop in my head, uh, one thing I recognized really early on was that both of them felt like they were uh, witnessing the end of something. Uh, I, I, I think that they both genuinely felt like uh, the world was ending. And so when I started thinking about uh, when do you set a contemporary novel uh, where that's kind of going to be a theme, the fall of 2016 was, was uh, a perfect time, uh, especially for this region. Um, a lot of people outside of the region may be familiar with the fires that were going on uh, that burned down the city of Gatlinburg in Tennessee. Uh, but the truth is we'd been experiencing those fires for months at that point. We'd had fires since September. Uh, you know, it, it, there were days you'd go outside and you couldn't see the sun for the smoke. Uh, and, and you had that going on and you had the, the political climate of the election in, in the fall of 2016. And I think for a lot of people, it, it, uh, it, it felt like the world was in it. So I said it then, um, as far as kind of where those characters came from, uh, you know, the, the character of Raymond Mathis was who I had first, uh, the father. Right. And uh, it, part of that story is, is, a, is, is based in truth, uh, like a lot of, like my last novel, in that I had, an, I had a singular event that I knew was true, and then I just let my mind make up the rest. And I knew a man up here whose, whose son had gotten really bad off on methamphetamine, uh, and he owed a great deal of money. And his father told that story of, uh, of riding up the mountain with $10,000 cash and a shotgun in his lap to buy his son's life back. Is that right? Uh, wow. Yeah. That's a real yeah. story. So, wow. Yeah. And so uh, I had that, um, and, and so I wanted to just, uh, I can't think of a, I can't think of a statement of love bigger than that uh you know and, and so and so i had that story of the father uh and then and then as far as denny rattler um uh, that character kind of developed separately uh but it became important for me uh that he's he's eastern band he's he's an enrolled member of the eastern band of cherokee indian uh and and grew up on the boundary and um the reason that i that i wanted uh that character and that perspective uh, was that I wanted to I wanted to balance uh, two community responses to the opioid crisis. So, for instance, uh, how we're handling things in Jackson County uh, versus how we're handling things in Cherokee, uh, that being just just over the county line. And I also wanted to to counterbalance and and juxtapose. Uh, Raymond's loss of culture, the, the death of a, of a mountain culture that he's experiencing uh, versus Denny Rattler experience a reclamation of culture, uh, which, is, which is what's taking place in Cherokee. Uh, and, and so for him, uh, I, think, I think having that, his perspective allowed me to, to get to a lot of uh, thematic depth that I, that I wouldn't have been able to get to otherwise. And I, I've heard you earlier uh, talk about, um, you know, with the Cherokee revitalization of culture and their, you know, you're actually starting to see native speakers 
coming up again. Um, you're seeing a little bit more of that out here in, in the West as well. Uh, not enough, but um, yeah. But I heard you talk about you know the, these these distinct eras. There's the pre-casino era and the post-casino yeah. era. Can you talk yeah. about that a little bit? Yeah, I, th I think if uh, you know if anybody is is familiar with with Cherokee here, uh, and so and so the town of Cherokee in, in North Carolina. Uh, if you if you go back and look at that 30 years ago, uh, even really 20 years ago, I think I think the casino opened in the late 90s, maybe 96 or somewhere around there. Uh, but but you you have a pre-casino reality and a post-casino reality. That pre-casino reality was very much uh, rubber tomahawks, uh, dream catchers, uh, people in headdresses, TPs, and it was. Uh, peddling anything that you could to compete for tourist dollars uh and when i you when still, i look you still back see at that shit out here yeah <laughs> you know all this uh, plains indian regalia you know yeah. for our area yeah and the, the the thing for me is that uh uh i think it's easy to look at that and be disgusted by it but but it was a matter of survival yeah uh, there was there was quite literally no other way to compete for those tourist dollars. And, and so they did what they had to do. Um, Post-casino Cherokee, so suddenly you got all of this money uh, piling into a community. Well, it would be easy to just, uh, you know, use that in whatever way, you know, it'd be easy to line a whole lot of pockets. Um, and what we've seen though, is that is that they're making tremendous investments into, into things that, uh, really no no other communities that i'm aware of are it, it, to me it's become a prime example of what socialized programming could look like when it's done well uh, and what i mean by that is is that there's not a child growing up there who doesn't have the opportunity to go to college uh, it's bought and paid for uh, they can go to college they're putting money into addiction services they're putting money into mental health services uh, and and that's not to say that any that all of that is being fully utilized at this moment, but I think you get a generation out, two generations out, I think you'd be really surprised by what that means for that community. Uh, they're also, they, they've completely kind of moved away from that, uh, kind of that, that tourist, tourist trap Indian uh, idea. And, and instead they're, they're really reclaiming every aspect of their culture from the art uh, to the language. You go back 25 years, that language was on the brink of extinction and now there are children being raised as native speakers. Uh, I think it's been something really fascinating to witness and and, and really what it boils down to is that, uh, is that the money gave them that freedom. Uh, that they, they don't, you know, they don't have to they don't have to do the things that they were doing 25 years ago. Right. And on the, on the other side of the coin, well, there's, there's a, yeah, I mean, there's a, a key point in the novel where I can't remember who's exactly talking, but someone's telling Denny, Denny Rattler, he's all, you know, you've got more opportunities in your community than we do. You know, uh, you've got a recovery house, you've got X, Y, and yeah. Z. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it was a police officer telling him that. Okay. Uh, a Cherokee police officer, right. uh, and he's basically saying, "Why, why the hell ain't you using it?" Because, because that's the other side is that uh, you know there's still a whole lot of addiction and and a and a lot of those services aren't being fully utilized. I think that's a reality as well. Well, when you when you're criminalizing addiction rather than treating it as a health crisis, you get two completely different philosophies. You know, yeah. and we could we yeah. could we could get into the prison for profit racket. We could get into yeah. all sorts of things that come out of all this. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but then uh, you know, Ray Raymond Mathis, the uh, the father and the, the the patriarch kind of hero character in this book. Um, when we first meet him, you know, he's uh, most of his life he's spending in the past. His wife, yeah. his wife is gone, um, and he's a guy who was obviously very much in love with his wife, and has a tremendous amount of love for his son, as messed up as his son is, you know, and yeah. he, he's he keeps saving him again and again and again. Um, yeah. 
I don't know. I don't know if there's really a question there, but just uh, just such a great, great character. Yeah. I th well, I think one of the things you're getting at, uh, as far as the looking back at the past, is, is a is a nostalgia, uh, and and that's very much uh, you know a central part of his character, and and part of the reason for that is that unlike Denny Rattler, who's who's experiencing this this reclamation of culture. Uh, Raymond's looking around and, and he doesn't recognize a damn thing. Uh, everything that he's ever known as, as far as what life in the mountains looked like is gone. Right. And if it ain't completely gone, it's fading fast. Uh, and so I, I think part of, part of the reason that he's, that, he's, uh, that he's always just going back into memory is because, because he looks around and he doesn't recognize anything familiar. That, yeah, there's a, uh, there's a, I guess I'll go ahead and bring it up now. Uh, there's a point in the book that, uh, there are a bunch of places that I marked, but I don't want to spoil anything. Um, you might know the, yeah. Yeah, there's a, there's a really, what I thought was a crucial passage where he says, uh, folks nowadays can't seem to understand why people like me and your daddy, he's talking to Leah, or Lee, is it Leah? Yeah, Leah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, never had much use for the law. Of course, Leia in the book is a police officer. Um, they look at some of the things uh, used to be commonplace, how somebody might come up missing or somebody might get burned out of their house, and they equate that with lawlessness. Well, it wasn't lawlessness. Matter of fact, it was the opposite. Uh, these mountains used to have their own kind of order. Uh, Ray drank the rest of his water, then slid the empty cup into the center of the table. Used to be we took care of our own up here. Used to be uh, when something needed done, we took care of it ourselves. Then we let folks from the outside come in and tell us how we ought to run things. And I want you to look around at where that's got us. You know, uh, that for me was a key scene in the book. Yeah, and, uh, yeah. And you see him, you know, at, at some point, and I, I won't spoil when that is, he decides he has to take action. He has no choice. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, the, you know, I th part of that is uh, is how rural this place is. There are still still places uh, in this county where if you called nine one one, hell, it might be an hour before they got to you. Uh, you know, especially where I live in Little Canada. Uh, and so there was a there was kind of there's always been a, a self sufficiency uh, and and kind of an an internal nature to community. Uh, you took care of your own. Uh, you know, if if some if somebody did something, uh, you know, it was handled within the community. And and uh, you know, it, really, I, I think I think what's happened is is that that sense of community is what has has fallen apart. Uh, I had a I had a guy who had a reading a couple of years ago, but he he grew up. He actually grew up just kind of east of where I'm sitting, uh, down around Toxaway. But I remember having a conversation with him, and and uh, I even used some of what he said in this in a scene in this book because it, what he said was uh, that when he was growing up, you know, if something needed done, you just you just took care of it. If if somebody needed a new roof put on their house, you put a new roof on their house. Uh, if somebody's car broke down and needed a ride, you give them a ride. And he said he said. Uh, now I don't even know my neighbor's names. Uh, and he said, and, and what's worse is that I don't want to. And I think that's really, uh, I think that's a, that's a true, that's a truth that, that is, that is taking place here is, is that, that, that sense of community that existed, uh, really not all that far back, uh, you know, 20 years ago is something that's disintegrating at a, at an unfathomable pace. Now, is that a combination of, um, you know, some of these economic factors, addiction, splitting the, com you know, the, the community apart, along with uh, an influx of new, new people into the area? Is it both things? I, I think it's primary. It's, it's, well, both of those things are tied directly together by economics. Right. Uh, you know, I, I think that, that when I look at what's happening, uh, here we had tourism shoved down our throats as a as a you know economic savior 
for decades and decades and decades. And every person who pushed that agenda refused to recognize it as an extractive economy. Uh, and the reality is it is an extractive economy. And, and so you've got that in combination with outside wealth moving into a place and, uh, and people can't even afford to live here no more. Uh, you know, it, what's, what's happening currently is that, is that we're becoming bedroom communities. Uh, you know, I read, I read something recently. It was a, it was a real estate report, uh, where they were, they were questioning people who wanted to move into Western North Carolina. And they said, you know, how, how long are you willing to commute each day in order to live in Western North Carolina? Uh, and, and people said an hour and a half. Uh, and which means that you could live in a place, uh, this won't make sense to people who aren't from here, but you could live in a place like Fines Creek, which is just crazy removed rural place. And you could be commuting an hour and a half to Knoxville, uh, and working in Knoxville. Um, so, so what's happening at this point is, is that, uh, you know, the price of land, the price of homes is, is reaching a place where nobody who's from here, nobody who lives here, works here can afford to, can afford to do it. Uh, you know, they're, they're being displaced. Right. It's, it's rural gentrification. I mean, it is what it ultimately boils down to. It's the same thing that's happening in cities. Uh, you know, when I look at what happened to my grandmother, uh, you know, that when they, when the city came for her land, they, they, told her she could sell it or that they would take it with eminent domain, uh, for an airport. Uh, she winds up selling it. You jump forward 20 years, the city still never did anything with it. And they, they gift that land to Amazon as an incentive to bring that business to, to the city. Uh, so that the gentrification that takes place in urban areas is, is really no different, uh, than what's, than what's taking place in rural areas. It, it's poor people being displaced. It's funny, not to digress, but you mentioned Knoxville, and of course, as a Cormac McCarthy fan, I automatically yeah. think of Sutri. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's such a wonderful novel. Is he, yeah. a, is he a big hero? And I, I want to get into also the language, and because um, that's, you know, when I read your book, when I read your work, it's, you have an ear tilted towards the poetry of the, pitched towards the poetry of the language. And I want to talk about the writing itself and, the, and, and your prose, which is absolutely gorgeous. Uh, and um, who were some of your kind of influences coming up as a writer? I know you read a lot of poetry as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I do. Um, I think really some of the, I mean, the first book that was ever handed to me that I fell in love with uh, as a, as kind of a more adult reader, uh, you know, and I, and I wasn't a huge reader as a child, but, uh, you know, I was maybe 19 or 20 and Ron Rash handed me a copy of, uh, William Gaze. I hate to see that evening sun go down. And I read that book and it was the first time that I realized that, that you could write a book or tell stories about the people that I knew and the places that I knew. Uh, and so that was really my introduction. Um, to, to that type of writing. And the thing about William Gay is, uh, is he's incredibly poetic. Uh, and then when you start getting into writers like Ron Rash or, you, or Cormac McCarthy, uh, you know, all of these writers, there's a, there's, uh, there's a whole lot of, uh, audible quality to their, to their sentences. Mm. And, and so I think I was really influenced by that. Uh, I'm influenced by, the way it, the way a sentence sounds, uh, I'm interested in in enforcing rhythm upon a reader through word choice and meter. Uh, you know, when it, now this is this isn't to say that that's something you do all the way through a novel because I think you could bog a reader down in it. Uh, but but when I think about something like the last chapter of this of this novel, uh, there's not a word there's not a word in that chapter that's not meant to be there. Uh, now, did you sweat that out? How how often was that? Did you rewrite and rewrite and carve and chisel, oh yeah, chisel yeah. away? Because that is a stunning ending. And, I, and I, well, and I don't know if you've ever seen the, uh, Ray McKinnon had a short film uh, called The Accountant. No. Uh, 
but but there's a scene in that uh and ray mckinnon and the two stars in that as well there's a scene in that where he delivers kind of this this uh dramatic monologue of of everything that's happening to southern culture and and it's gorgeous and i think i was really influenced by that uh there's a direct reference to uh jim wayne miller's the briar poems mm. uh in in that i was really influenced by that um and and so I, I had this idea of, of what I wanted that chapter to do and really those were two of the models and and so uh, you know it, it was a matter of, of trying to trying to get that right and then once you, and then once you got it on the page then it's just sitting there and, uh, and then it's a piece of clay you know you can sit there and, and turn it into a pot at that point and uh, that's the fun part I think for me I, I really like uh, I really like trying to get get to that that rhythm. Right. Now let's talk just talk a little bit about um, you know kind of southern literature. It's a big topic. Uh, I, you know, I heard I've heard you speak on this before. Um, you know, and it's. Uh, do you think of yourself uh, as a southern writer? Do you have that sense of identity? Well, yeah. I mean, yeah. Uh, and it, and it's because that's. Uh, that's how I view the world. My worldview is shaped very much by the fact that I was born and raised in North Carolina and have never left North Carolina. Right. Uh, you know, and so it shapes everything uh, about about how how I view the world. Um, I think sometimes that can be a a marginalizing term, uh, especially for people from the outside. And that then that then they you know pigeonhole it into a, a certain thing. Uh, and then at the same time, sometimes I think there are books that we don't talk enough about as far as their southernness. Uh, and, and so I was, I, I mentioned this in a, in a, uh, you know, one of these interviews last night, but I think about a writer like Maurice Ruffin, uh, who's, who's a new, new Orleans based writer. Uh, he had, to, he, you know, I guess it was maybe a year, year or two years ago, his, his debut novel, uh, We Cast a Shadow came out, uh, one of the most important books in American literature of the past couple decades in my in my mind. I heard you, uh, I heard and, you mention it, and I'm gonna have I wasn't familiar with it, so I love hearing but, things like that. I'll, I'll look it well, up. Well, I, I I think when we talk about Maurice, though, we talk the the immediate reaction is to talk about his work as a black writer and as black literature, uh, uh, instead of also at the same time recognizing. Uh, that he is very much a Southern writer. Uh, in the same way that my worldview is shaped by that reality, his worldview has been shaped by that reality. And I think sometimes we, we refuse to, to uh, put these other perspectives in because we don't want to complicate the narrative. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we, yeah. we want the South to be this, this uh, you know, Theme very, uh, yeah, this singular thing. Uh, we, we, we don't want to be. We we don't want to complicate that. Right. Um, you know, when I think about Appalachia, uh, there's a very, at least my understanding of the Celtic, heavy Celtic tradition. Uh, you know, it's funny when I when I went to Ireland and and you know read a lot of Irish writers too. I I hear that same. I don't know that same love of the, of the language, the same turn of phrase, the same musicality that you hear yeah. in a lot of Appalachian or you know region. Would you agree with that, or do you think there's that's a valid point? Uh, in some ways, uh, you know, there were certainly Scotch Irish uh, that that settled here, uh, but there were a whole lot of other people that settled here as well. Um, I th honestly, I think a lot of it is uh, the Bible. Uh, I, you know, I think about when when I think about Southern literature and uh, the way that we tell stories, why our stories are violent. Uh, you know, the the phrase and uh, the way the the iambic nature of things. All of it, I think, is very much King James related. Mm. Uh, you know, I was I was on that. You were talking recently about that uh, that well-read yeah. comedy podcast, yeah. and and Drew Morgan, uh, his father was a minister, and he said he said that's exactly what I did. He said I stole my father's rhythm, 
you know, he stole he stole the way that he tells the story. Uh, and I think for a lot of Southern writers uh, and Appalachian writers, um, that that's something that you cannot escape uh, from your past. I, you know, there was a guy, he was from another country. I, I think he was, actually, I think he was from Ireland. Uh, and it, he was here for a friend of mine's wedding. Uh, and we were riding around. And, and the thing that fascinated him was he said, the only thing that y'all have is churches and gun stores. And, uh, and I'd never really thought about it, uh, you know, because <laughs> I grew up here. But when you look around, it's like, yeah. Uh, I mean, you ride, you ride down the road for a mile, and hell, you might pass five or six churches. Uh, you know, that's something that uh, is very much, it's impossible for me to think about Southern literature and Appalachian literature without making that connection uh, to religion. Yeah, there's a there's a, a lot of theater to it, you know, the way it's yeah. presented. And, um, you know, you think about, oh gosh, I mean, any number of examples, you know, Flannery O'Connor comes to mind, absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, Carson McCullough, yeah, you know, lots of people like that. Yeah, it's you know it's what Flannery said. Uh, you know they they asked her if the if the South was Christ centered, and she said, I don't know if it's Christ centered, but it is most certainly Christ haunted, uh, <laughs> and and that's absolutely the reality of of uh, of this place. I think it was oh gosh was it it was uh, Joyce or Beckett who said that Ireland the Irish were a, a priest ridden race. So that was yeah. a good a good comment. Um, uh, getting back to the to the book, the subject at hand, um, I wanted to ask you about. I remember laughing out loud when I came across the outlet mall, the description yeah. of the outlet mall. Is that was that an invention, or can you describe what that what that is? Yeah, it was basically a you know a, a group of uh, four or five trailers in in a little area, and they were running it. Uh, they were running different drugs out of each out of each one. Uh, and so if, if you was looking for, uh, you know, prescription pills, you went in one. If you was looking for heroin, you went in another. If you was looking for meth, you went in another one. Uh, they was running prostitution out of one of them. Uh, one-stop shopping. Yep, yep, one-stop shopping. Uh, and I, there are elements of truth to that. Uh, you know, there, there are places here that are like that. Uh, there are places... Uh, me and my dad were talking about recently. He, he uh, they were still in uh, trying to think of what, what the, they were still in a part out from under cars, basically all over this area. And that for whatever reason, uh, it's a super valuable part to steal out of a car. They could steal it in like three minutes or something. So this was happening all over uh, this area. And when he got the talking to the police it happened to the church van at my parents church they they stole this uh i, I can't remember what the what the name of the party is Catalytic but anyways converted. that's the one yeah. yeah that's it yeah very commonly uh, stolen <laughs> yeah and and so he gets to talking to the police officer about it and uh the police officer told him he knew exactly where it was where it was where these people were and it was in a place very similar to the outlet mall you know this mm. this small little tiny group of uh, trailers where there was a whole bunch of crime moving moving through a singular spot. Right. Now, this is probably, I don't know, I hesitate to bring this up, but um, there is, uh, the way you describe in the book, uh, you know, the experience, uh, there, I mean, the language is beautiful, but you, you describe the experience of somebody uh, shooting up with a needle. Yeah. And um, the description you know, the le I think you, the levee breaks and the light and color and sound and time explodes. I can't remember exactly how yeah. you put it, but there, you know, I've heard it said that, you know, a lot of addicts, especially with the, you know, the mystic opium related uh, drugs are looking for something spiritual in their addiction. You know, you know you've heard that said and, yeah. and you really, in your description, you really uh, evoke that capture that um, and then you also describe the hellish agony of withdrawal you know what these yeah. guys go through and um, I'm not going to put you on the spot and say personal experience but 
I'm sure you've known people who've gone through this personally. And uh, where do you get that sort of authenticity in those details? Uh, well, I think first and foremost, you know, I've written a lot about addiction, whether it was uh, where all light tends to go, or it was the way to this world, or, or this novel. All three of those novels are largely about addiction. Uh, and I think that's because addiction is something I absolutely understand. Uh, I grew up, you know, the kids I grew up around uh, were addicts. Uh, their parents were addicts. Uh, I was, if I wasn't a full-blown addict, I was incredibly well, there's nothing else to call it. I, you know, I think when I was a, when I was young, yeah, I was I was absolutely an addict, um, and and so addiction is something that I that I understand well. I think uh, heroin, not so much, and and so it became a matter of uh, of of you know a whole a whole lot of reading on that. Um, it's but as far as as capturing. Uh, that drive, uh, I, I think that still comes naturally for me. As, as far as why, uh, it was because it, it became an inignorable reality of, of my day-to-day -day life. Uh, you know, I, there was a house about 100 yards up from where I was living at the time where most of the heroin in the county was moving through. Uh, I had addicts in my, in my front yard. I had addicts knocking on the door uh, asking for sewing kits because they wanted to skim pop. Uh, you would go to the post office, you'd step out of your truck, and there'd be 30 needles on the ground. Uh, it, it became inignorable. Uh, and so that was why I chose to write about it. Uh, sure. and, and yeah, I've known, I've known piles of, piles of people. Uh, you know, I think about the first friend of mine that I, that I ever uh, remember hearing that had, that had died of an overdose was a, was a guy named Travis Snipes. I, I just, to this day, I remember, uh, I can still see a smile. I can, I can see him on a little league field. Uh, and then as we grew up, you know, he just, uh, we parted like hell and, and he kind of went his way and I went my way. Uh, but when Travis died, his father and his brother both died within a year. Uh, you know, three generations, uh, wiped out in a year from it. Uh, so I, I think it just became, uh, there were a whole lot of things that just kind of built onto each other. And like I say, it, it was just inignorable. Uh, you know, it, you walk out your front door and it's right there. And then you see, you know, like a lot of people have written about, you know, Don Winslow and, you know, our, our, our good friend Jake Todd Scott, who we were talking about earlier. Um, you know, this whole thing where, you know, per, Purdue and other pharmaceutical companies get people hooked and then the supply is taken away, and where do they go? They go to heroin, because it's available yeah. and it's cheap. And then, you know, it's just this very grim kind of algorithm of uh, economics, you know, where yeah. the synthetic opiates and the fentanyls and things like that are just killing people all over the place, you know, just yeah. left, left and right. Yeah. yeah. Um, now, for, for you, uh, you know, as a young man, kind of um, your your road out was, uh, I'm assuming, was writing, ultimately. And yeah. when, when did you start? When did you start writing, seriously? Pretty much my whole life. I, I mean, I, I joke and say by the time, uh, I mean, by the time I got to college, I, I'd probably written a thousand pages. Uh, and, and in college, another thousand. Uh, none of that was any good. Uh, none of it, and and uh, I definitely wasn't a quick study, uh, but I think I was always compelled to tell stories, uh, and 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 so yeah, I, honestly, I don't remember a time when I wasn't uh, writing from a very very young age. Uh, I mean, my mother was there was an old typewriter. Uh, I've told this story before, but they, you know, she was a potter, and and at night she would sit at the end of one couch and make pots. And at the other end of the couch, there was an end table, and up under that end table was an old electric typewriter. And I can remember pulling that thing out, and the way that it sounded when you plugged it in, uh, the way that it smelled when it heated up that paper. And I would tell her stories, and, and she would tell me how to spell the words. Oh, wow. Uh, and so that compulsion, uh, and it's very much a compulsion, 
I think is something that's uh, that I've never been without. Uh, it's all, it's just always been there. Uh, and at the same time, like I said, it's just that it, it didn't come. I don't think that it came naturally for me either. Uh, you know, it, it took a whole, whole lot of work uh, and it took a whole lot of getting things wrong and I still get things wrong. Uh, you know, that last novel, the line that held us, I wrote an entire novel and it was no good. Uh, and I completely trashed it and started over. I you know, I had 70, about that. Yeah. yeah, I mean, 75,000 words and uh, set it on fire and start over. And that, and that can happen again and again and again. Uh, you know, it, it's, uh, it just takes a whole lot of, a whole lot of work. Um, people always want to talk about talent and yeah, talents. I think talent's important, but the people that I know who have, who have, uh, really made a go at it, uh, were probably more stubborn than they were talented. You know, they just, just head down and kept doing the work. When you first kind of started out, were you going through that process that a lot of writers go through where you're, you know, you're kind of emulating your heroes and, uh, they're trying to write in their, in their style? Uh, maybe, uh, but, but not in a fiction sense. Uh, a, a lot of what I was writing early on was I was writing, uh, I was, it was more nature, right? Uh, you know, I, I wanted to be John Jirak, uh, who, who writes these, these brilliant collections of fly fishing essays. Uh, that's the reason the very first book I ever wrote and the very first book that was ever published of mine uh, was a memoir called Growing Gills. Uh, you know, I was obsessed with, with people like Edward Abbey, uh, Leslie Marmon Silco. Uh, I was reading all of these these uh, natural history type writers uh, Jim, more so than I, than I was fiction. Jim Harrison? Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and as, you know, especially later on, but I, but I think if I was emulating anybody, it probably wouldn't be the, the ones that people would think. Uh, you know, they'd probably they'd probably read my work and think, oh, it, it was probably Larry Brown or this or that. And uh, the reality is, is it was uh, it was people like John Girac, uh, you know, Harry Middleton, uh, who wrote on the Spine of Time. Uh, you know, Dave Ames, James Prosek, all of all of these. Uh, Pete Fromm. Uh, I think Pete Fromm continues to be one of the most overlooked uh, American writers. He, and, and luckily, he's got a huge following in France. Uh, but, but as a country, we continue to sleep on his work. Uh, but, and I knew him for his, for his, like I say, his natural history stuff. Uh, but he's a hell of a story writer, a hell of a novelist. Uh, and so I, th I think if I was to really try to pin down who those early influences are. It, it was people like that. It, it, it probably wasn't the, the ones that would make more sense, like William Gay or, or Larry Brown. Or or, like yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. You know, somebody's name that I always like to bring up, I, I know we're both probably good, big fans of Daniel Woodrell. Um, yeah. Uh, there's another writer from that region that I think is criminally neglected, which is Donald Harrington. You know his absolutely. Work? Yeah, yep, I mean, absolutely. Beautiful writer, you know, the choiring of the trees. Yeah, choiring of the trees is is uh, probably my favorite novel of his. Uh, what was the the cockroaches and need more? Stay more. Stay more. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, That yeah, that was a good one. Uh, but yeah, the choiring of the trees I think was probably my favorite novel of his. But yeah, absolutely criminally underrated. Yeah, Madison. And, and really one of the only Arkansas writers too that you, you know. Uh, that I, that I can really think of Woodrell being Missouri uh, and Harrington being being Arkansas. Yeah. It really, we don't we don't think about uh, you know Arkansas yeah. or we don't talk about Arkansas enough. But uh, uh, yeah, Donald Harrington is, is brilliant. He's the real deal. There was another guy, an Alabama writer named Madison Jones. Did you ever come across him? No. He was good. no. Uh, it's funny because Lansdale, who I mentioned at the beginning. He and I, uh, we like to trade obscure writers. You know, he collects yeah. them too. And um, well, I've done it again. I've hogged the entire hour almost. So let me let me get to some of these questions, David. You All got, right. You yeah. got a lot of a lot of people watching. Um, and uh, a friend of mine, Stefan Blafovich, says the choiring of the trees is phenomenal. That's right, Stefan. 
great book. Uh, let's see here. Hmm. Okay. Uh, a viewer named Joe Santa, which is a great name. Uh, do you see yourself expanding beyond Appalachia in, in, in any future books? If so, any vision as to what it might involve? I don't think so, uh, and I think it's because I've, I've, uh, I know this place incredibly well, uh, and more so than Appalachia, I know, I know this part of Appalachia uh, very well, but Western North Carolina, uh, and more, even more specifically, Jackson County, uh, and, and that's never felt like a limitation to me. Uh, it's actually, in a lot of ways, made things easier, uh, and I also... I, you know, I've said this till I'm blue in the face, but I, I, I always talk about uh, James Joyce. And when they asked James Joyce why he only wrote about Dublin, and he said, because if I can get to the heart of Dublin, I can get to the heart of every city of the world. Uh, and that's absolutely right. You know, what he was saying was that was that the universal was was contained within the particular. And, and I very much feel that way. I, I don't think that there's a story... Uh, that I would ever want to tell that I couldn't sit here and tell about these people. You know, it's funny, one of, I guess my question would be, um, one of my favorite books of, uh, of, our, of Daniel Woodrell's is his uh, Civil War novel called Woe yeah, to, War to Live On. Just a masterpiece. And, yeah. uh, and also The Maid's Version too is another historical. Um, have you ever considered writing a purely historical novel set in your region? No. No? No. Uh, and what's funny, it's, it's very hard for me to read anything historical. That's my least favorite Woodrell novel. Is that right? <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, I love, uh, I love The Death of Sweet Mister and Tomato Red are probably my two favorites. But uh, yeah, I, I, I was thinking recently about, uh, well, Ron Rash, uh, you know, and, and the stuff of Ron that I loved, I loved the story collection Burning Bright. Everybody knows him for Serena. Mm -hmm. uh, and he just had this, this new book come out of short fiction and when I was at the bookstore I, the, I asked the bookseller I said was well, it all historic because I knew it was <laughs> part of it there was a Serena novella in there and I said is it all historic and he started looking and he said there's horses and it was <laughs> and it, uh, he, he knew he knew uh, I probably wouldn't be in for it because I love I love contemporary stories for whatever reason uh, yeah. that that just seems to be what what drives me more uh i can never see myself writing something pre-depression okay. uh so maybe depression era forward it, uh, but again i i seriously doubt that i i imagine that everything everything that i've written so far has been linear uh you know every book has happened after the one before uh, and this book was set, you know, in 2016. The book I'm working on now, in my mind, it's probably set in last summer. Uh, you know, so I, I think for me, it tends to be more uh, the stories that, that come to my mind are, are contemporary. They just never seem to be historic right. or types of stories. Let's see. Um, uh, Blue, B-L-U, asks... David, do you have soundtracks for your books, meaning particular songs or artists that you listen to while you write or that capture or set the tone of the book? Yeah. Uh, with, I think one thing I recognized really early on, and this with novels particularly, and this came really naturally with the first novel, with Where All Light Tends to Go, because that, that novel came to me uh, in the first person. I could hear him talking. Uh, and when I heard Jacob McNeely's voice, uh, it was riding on a song, uh, and it was Towns Van Zant's Rex's Blues. Great song. And, and when I think about uh, looking back, what that allowed was that it always allowed an avenue back into the story. So, like, I could be away from the story for uh, lengths of time, and then when I was trying to get myself dialed back into it, I could just hit play and you know find my way back in and so i think i think i've always uh that's a question i ask about about my characters is i want to i want to know what they hum in the shower uh i want to know the song that that drives them uh with this novel uh 
there were really two songs that that kept playing in in my mind over and over uh and one of those there's a writer named uh, a songwriter named benjamin todd uh and he plays in a band with his wife called the lost dog street band uh but he had a song called using again uh and i and i listened to that uh over and over or i listened to a, a songwriter named arlo mckinley uh he had a song called bag of pills and i listened to those two songs uh over and over when i was writing this this novel uh, and, and so I don't know that it's always a full-blown soundtrack, but I do think a lot of times there's a song that accompanies a character, and it serves a it serves as a great way to kind of uh, enter in and out of that character's head. Do you know? It's funny you mentioned Towns Van Zandt. You know, um, I got to see him live once, and uh, it was an amazing experience. I caught him on a good night. You know, where he was yeah. he was probably drunk, but just not quite drunk, too drunk to play. Yeah. And um, he played, do you know that song of his called Marie? Um, I'd have to hear it. Yeah, no, it's, it's, a, it's a really amazing piece um, about homelessness, really, and about this yeah. doomed homeless couple. Um, but I remember I'd never heard it before, and I saw it live, and it just, uh, for the first time, and heard it live. Just, mm -hmm. whew, I still get goosebumps thinking about it. Uh, yeah. Now that's, yeah. uh, boy, that guy was a talent, you know. And yeah. He, he wasn't going to be long for this world. You knew he wouldn't. Yeah. 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 Um, if I th if I the other things I mean, I mean if I think of a single song, uh, looking back now that that kind of defines this book, uh, American Aquarium's got a new album out that's called Le uh, Lamentations. Uh, but the opening track of that is called Me and Mine. And if you listen to that song uh, thematically, it, it mirrors a whole lot of what I was trying to do with this novel. What's the, uh, what's the band called? Or is it a band? Yeah, American Aquarium. Uh, and the name of the album is uh, Lamentations, like the book in the Bible. Right. Dig it. I'm going to look that up. All right, let's see. Sorry, people. Uh, we digress. Um, okay, Bessie asks, let's see, excited to tune in. Alan and I say hello and congrats all the way from the Bay Area on your newest book. David, we can't wait to read it. So this must be some friends of yours. Uh, just checking in. Um, yeah, Steve Schwartz, good friend of mine. Uh, you know him too. He always comes yeah. to our events. Really fine writer and a cool guy. Uh, says, say hi to David, ask him what he will be working on next. Can you tell us a little bit about your work in progress? Yeah, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm probably about halfway done with a, with a novel called uh, Those We Thought We Knew. Um, and I got, like I said, it's a contemporary novel, uh, you know, set, set kind of probably last summer. Uh, but it's really, uh, I think trying to tackle race in a in a in a lot of ways, uh, specifically here in Jackson County. Um, I think Appalachia as a region is a place that has historically uh, and continues to be whitewashed. Uh, you know, people who ain't from here uh, think that the only people who who live here and ever lived here was white folks. Uh, and the truth is, you know, I, I think about Jackson County. One of the oldest churches in this in this county was an AME church down in Cullowhee that was started by by 12 former slaves um, and and so it, I think it was about trying to uh, reconcile that reality uh, and at the same time I wanted it to be a book that examined uh, racism uh, from primarily a white perspective uh, I, I wanted to look at, at all the different ways that that kind of racism works within within the white community from from just really minor things to to more uh overt forms of it uh it's been a you know i've been working on that book for probably two years uh it's, be, it's become a really interesting time to be trying to write that novel because uh all, all of a sudden a whole lot of the things that i was that i was writing about uh started taking place in real time uh you know right outside the door 
uh, and, and so it's been an interesting time to try to write that. Uh, what's your at what's, the same, what's your entry what, point? Do you have a character that of the new book? Who's your protagonist? Uh, well, so the novel starts with a with a, a granddaughter uh, who wasn't raised here, but has come back to tell the story of, of this church. She's an art student, and uh, so so one thing that that and it, like a, you know a lot of things start with one element of truth. One thing that happened was that AME Church in Colowee. It, it's on a it used to sit on a university campus, and as that university expanded in the in the late 1920s uh they forced them to dig up their dead and move their church down the mountain and there's a site in order to make room for a residence hall uh and there's a sign out there that gives us you know this used to be the site of this church and on such and such a date they moved uh and that verb phrase that verb choice uh absolutely infuriates me because they didn't move uh, they were removed uh, and, and so the novel starts with this with this granddaughter coming back to this site and recreating that removal of, of the graves uh, as a as an art installation and uh, and so it's it's her and it's her grandmother uh, it's it's a bunch of different law enforcement characters it's probably a lot more law enforcement heavy than anything I've ever written as well uh, but yeah, I've, I've got, I never like to have more than maybe five characters at a time because I don't feel like as a writer that's something I'm able to wrestle uh, is anything more than that. So I try, I like to keep it, I really like three. Uh, if I can keep it to three main characters, I feel a lot more in control. Five and, it, and I can still manage, but uh, if it gets any more than that, I'm not a, I'm not the kind of writer that can, that can make that work right um, let's see I just have a couple of really nice comments here uh, Michelle uh, Wolf says uh, your books capture the human condition so they apply to human hearts regardless of geography a really nice oh, thank you. nice sentiment uh, okay let's see okay uh, Jordan farmer uh, writer really has a yeah good, yeah boys and flood yeah great book um, he's watching and he says, could you discuss the complications or experience of writing multiple narrative, narrative perspectives or points of view in your books? Yeah, yeah, I think uh, for me, uh, I, I'm going to use The Weight of This World, that novel, as a good example because I had, like I said, I had three characters. Uh, I, really li I really like working with three characters. Uh, that seems a lot more manageable to me. Um, with that novel, though, there would be lots of scenes where all three of those characters would be in the room. And so the question that you then have to ask or that I would ask is who provides the most interesting perspective in that moment? And that's the question I'm always asking myself, I think, uh, you know, as a writer. Is, is who's got the most interesting perspective into the room at this moment. And sometimes there's only one character that has, has any perspective into a moment at all. But a lot of times uh, I'm making a very deliberate choice for who I think uh, is able to add, add what needs, needs to be added to the story. Uh, and so when I'm trying to write, you know, different perspectives, that's, that's ultimately what it boils down to for me is, is I, I'm looking at the overall story and I'm trying to decide uh, who, who has the ability to offer the most interesting perspective to the reader and, and that's the person I follow. Um, it's funny, I can't remember who it was that said this, but uh, somebody was saying that, and I've seen it with passages in your books, uh, a, a writer who has you know two or three characters in a scene and um, is writing dialogue with no attribution is really paying attention to their characters you know so yeah. I thought that was an interesting point and I've seen that in your work um, okay Bessie Bessie another good question she says uh, if you could time travel what writing advice would the uh, let's see would the now you give your younger self as you began your first novel uh, it'd be the trust process uh, 
I mean, that, that, I think that's an easy one for me in that, uh, as a young writer, I, 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 you know, I've told this story a lot, but as a young writer, I was watching Ron Rash and Ron was, uh, always a very methodical writer. Like he sat down at his desk at a certain time every morning, everything had to be set just so. And when it was all set, just so he would work. And he did that every day. Um, and watching that, and hearing all of these other writers talk about, well, write every day, write every day, uh, I felt incredibly inadequate because I, I never worked like that. Um, and then eventually, you know, I kind of reached a place where I realized that, uh, that, you know, I might go six months, I might go a year, uh, I might go a year and a half without writing anything. Uh, and that's not to say stories aren't building in the back of my head or that characters aren't developing, but that's saying I'm not physically writing. Uh, and then all of a sudden it'll hit and, uh, and then it, and then it doesn't let up and I, you know, it just all comes, comes out, uh, in, in one giant burst. Uh, and so I think it would be that, I think it would be learn to trust in that process, learn to know that it's all right not to write every day. I think, I think writers, uh, more so in this country than anywhere else. And it's because it's because of the way that, uh, Americans have uh, economized art uh, and made it a job, but so, but so Americans tend to want to be able to, when they ask questions about writing, they tend to approach it like an equation, and they think that if they can get the variables for A and B and C, they can say A plus B plus C equals D, and then they have a book, uh, and the reality is that uh, a is different for everybody. B is different for everybody. And so a lot of times you get all of this writing advice where these people are, are telling you, uh, this is how you do it. And, and, uh, that's how they do it. Yeah. Uh, that's not how I do it. That's not, you know, how Joe Lansdale does it. Uh, you know, that's not how Laura Littman does it. All of us do things entirely differently. Uh, and I, I think one of the most valuable things that can happen for a writer and for an artist in general is to is to learn to recognize their own process and to trust in it. It's funny. I uh, what you're saying it makes so much sense. I I, I heard James Salter, who's another hero, uh, talk about you know what he needed as a, in a writing space, which was uh, silence and preferably a completely empty house. You know, nobody yeah. else even in the house. And then yeah. you hear people that you know have you know loud hip hop music going you know you hear people yeah. or Pete Dexter or somebody like that who works you know throughout the night you know, everybody's yeah. everybody's different so you think people yeah. try to try to kind of conform to what they think they need to do well well i think that uh, i think that as americans because of the way that we've economized art and we've economized writing i mean we, the questions that you get asked by an American audience don't even get asked in other places. Uh, the French never ask uh, questions really about about process in the way that Americans do. Uh, you know, we've got it. We've we've created uh, a machine to make writers, uh, the MFA machine. Right. Uh, you know, to to pump these things out, um, and that's what I mean by by economizing uh, literature and art. Uh, and I think one of the downfalls of that has has been uh, that that we think it's something that that you can plug in these variables and get a product. Uh, and and the reality is that uh, that's that's not really how it works. It's kind of uh, an in infomercial approach. Yeah, and and the reality is, I mean, you know. I, I'd be the same as Salter. I want an empty house and absolute silence. And then uh, Maurice Ruffin, who I spoke about earlier, he, I know for a fact he sits there and listens to music. Mm. Uh, and then I, tons of other writers are able to, you know, do it other ways. I, I think learning to learning to see and recognize uh, what you need it is probably one of the most valuable things uh, to recognize as a as a writer. I uh, you know it's I know that you're uh, or at least I, I learned today earlier that you're um, you're big in France. 
No, I don't know. I wouldn't say that. that. Uh, but I would say I have a, I have an audience more there than I've, than I've ever really felt here. Uh, really? I've, yeah. Um, and I, and I think that, I think that's true of a, of a lot of people. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, hell, there are writers that, that, uh, I think about a writer like Benjamin Whitmer, yeah. uh, his past two novels haven't even come out here. Is that uh, right? I wonder what happened to him. He wrote Pike and then that other, uh, yeah. Cry something. Yeah, cry, cry father. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and the, and his pastor, and then the you know, he hasn't been able to sell another novel here. But every novel he has, he was a bestseller in France. Yeah. Uh, James you know, Salas, you know, is a good friend of mine and uh, lives here in Phoenix. Is just you know, brilliant writer, uh, and he's, you know, I mean, Drive, the movie Drive, gave him a, a little bit of a commercial bump. Um, but he's big in Europe, and he's really well, you know, well received in France. And he'll, yeah. I'm sure, like yourself, he'll go over to uh, these big festivals, and and I've heard Joe Lansdale talk about this too, you know. And it's like the way you guys are treated when you go over there is so completely different than here. You know? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. And I've I've been at a festival with Joe, uh, and and uh, you know. I can tell you flat out, they're lined out the booth to get to him. Uh, you know, every everybody knows his work there, and and uh, there are people who you know were read here. I, th I think about we spoke about him earlier, Jim Harrison. That, that, this isn't saying that Jim Harrison wasn't big here, uh, but Jim Harrison was a god in France. I heard that. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, 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 the first time I ever went to France, it was it was the fall after he had died. And they were having a this memorial service for him, and they was a, they was probably a thousand people lined down this street just to get in here and watch this small little film they'd made about him. Uh, and I thought I thought to myself that there's nowhere in this country where, in America, where a thousand people would line up to go into this little tiny spot and watch, uh, you know, a 30 minute film about Jim Harrison. Uh, I, I don't know of any place. Well, you know, the French and other European, Germany, um, you know, they put a lot of money, they invest in art, in their, you know, in their, in their communities. Um, yeah. And then, you know, if you, it's funny, I, I keep bringing up Ireland because I know it a little bit better, uh, which is, you know, you pick up a Sunday edition of the Irish Times, it's amazing how much coverage from this tiny little island is devoted to the arts, you know, and, yeah. and, and literature. And when I was over there, it was uh, in 99, a little bit before they went to, uh, they got rid of the Irish pound. But, I, you know, there's James Joyce on your ten Irish 10 pound note. And I'm mm -hmm. thinking, you know, this country has its priorities straight. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you know? Absolutely. Um, well, let's see here. I know it's probably, all right, one more. Uh, yeah, Blue asks, again, you're talking about writing and, um, are, do you write in longhand or do you type on a computer? I type on a computer, and it's it's just because of the amount of editing uh, that I do, and the fact that I edit uh, as I go. I, so I I don't just you know flat rough draft the whole thing out and then go back. Uh, if everything's not pretty precise, I'm I'm not going to be able to go to sleep, and and so I I edit constantly, and as a result, I have to use a computer. Uh, if I was to write longhand, what had happened is it it just all gets scribbled out, and by the end of the day, I wouldn't have anything but uh, a page with every word on it marked out. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, David, uh, thanks for spending so much time this evening. I know it's getting late yeah, out there. Yeah, of course, of but, course. But uh, congratulations on the new book. It's just just phenomenal, and uh, you know. Uh, Really appreciate it. Hope to see you again. Yeah, yeah. Back here in the Thank desert. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Where can we get one of those hats, too? I've had a couple of viewers mention that. Uh, that's a Bitter Southerner hat. Oh, is it? Uh, okay. Yeah, which is a which is a great literary magazine, uh, an online literary magazine. But you could get it from there. There's a writer named David Tremblay that actually sent me that hat. Is uh, that right? Yeah. Do you, another magazine, Do you have you ever written for uh, Garden and Gun? Oh yeah, yeah. I've got a piece coming out there this fall. Do they have hats? I don't know if they have hats or not. Merchandise? That would be a cool thing yeah. to have. Yeah. 
Yeah, well, I, I know that they have a speakeasy uh, in Atlanta, I believe, hmm. where you can go in there and, and have drinks and, uh, you know, and things like that. That's too cool. Yeah, I got a turkey hunting essay coming out there this fall. Is that right? Yeah. Very yeah. cool. Well, you know, uh, again, congrats on the publication of the book. Very exciting. Um, and uh, have a great evening, and we hope to hope to see you again out here in the desert before too long. Indeed, indeed. Right. You invite me, and I'll come out there. You bet. And thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Uh, sorry to keep yeah, you so thank long. You. But have a yeah. great night, man. You too. All right. Take care. Go and meeting. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate you hanging in there with us. It was a, a real fun event.